Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. My name is Katalina Katalin, and I am the publisher of Helena History Press, a press that deals with scholarship about and from Central and East Europe in English. Um, it's my pleasure to extend our warm welcome to all of you tonight on behalf of the Danube Institute and Helena History Press. At today's book launch, we're honored to introduce the last work of the distinguished Hungarian-born academic, Jörg Scheplin, political scientist and member of European Parliament. The book is titled, A Contested Europe, Polemics, Papers, and Essays, and is off the press just this week. In an interview a few months before his passing, Professor Scheplin famously described himself as a European of Hungarian issue. It is from this perspective that these essays were selected by him to be included in the book. Professor Shiplin felt that academics seldom have the chance of seeing how theory operates in the real world. What politics is like at the coal face is how he phrased it. Conversely, that politicians rarely have the luxury of pondering political theory. Professor Shiplin explores the question from both perspectives in contested Europe. Perhaps U.S. journalist Christopher Caldwell best summarized the role that Professor Shiplin played within European Parliament. He had this to say in 2019 after ha read, having read the manuscript of this work. Quote, there is no one on the European political landscape as hard to categorize as the scholar statesman George Shiplin. As a university political scientist in England, he stands out as a particularly Central European kind of a polyglot Renaissance man. As a member of European Parliament for Hungary's dynamic Fidesz party, he has brought to some of the bitterest recent EU battles an Anglo-Saxon common sense and fair play. And for decades, he's been writing enduring literary, political, historical essays that make complicated things clear and crooked stories straight." Unquote. We hope that this compendium of essays from Professor Shiplin will help make these complicated issues clear and crooked stories straight. We, we feel that these are indispensable reading for anyone who wants to know how po political theory works in practice. I look forward to the insights our panel of distinguished speakers have gleaned from this collection of essays and their analysis of a contested Europe, and I thank them in advance for their gracious participation. Um, and before I um, turn this program over to our moderator and our gracious host, John O'Sullivan, president of the Danube Institute, I'd let, like to recognize um, two special guests who joined us today. I'm looking around because I don't know if Balash Hidvegi is here. Um, we were expecting him. He's a member of European Parliament for Hungary uh, since 2019. Well, when he arrives, John will introduce him. But in the meantime, a very special guest um, is George Shiflin's widow, Pirette Piker. Pirette, please stand up. Pirette is a distinguished scholar in her own right, and uh, we thank her for traveling from her home in Tallinn, Estonia, to be with us for this book launch today. And I'll turn it over to John O'Sullivan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <coughs> I'd like first to thank Kathleen Kaidar-Lynn for her kind introduction. And on behalf of the Danube Institute, I want to thank her and the Helena History Press for our collaboration today in this book launch of George Shoflin's important new book, A Contested Europe. I would also like to say more generally that we're grateful to Helena History Press and to Dr. Kai Dolin for earlier successful and productive collaborations, notably uh, the republication of Geza Jasensky's book, Lost Prestige, and the memoirs of Hungary's wartime Ministry of Defense, The Fateful Years, which is an important book historically uh, and which was named as the Book of the Year in the London Spectator um, by the French political commentator Anne-Elizabeth Moutet. 
Now, we're delighted to be holding this uh, book launch with Hill and the History Press, uh, and I would like to echo her welcome uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Perrette, Dr. Shoflin's wife, as she said, a distinguished scholar in her own right. We're delighted that you can be present here at this celebration of your husband's life and work. Thank you for coming. We at the Danube Institute are delighted to be associated with the publication of what is a remarkable book. Um, as Dr. Cadolin said to me, the introduction alone is worth the price of admission. And I think it is bound to have an impact on the way we think about Europe, in the way we think about Hungary, in the way we think about Brexit, and in the way we think about the course of European and global politics over the next few years. But we also have other reasons, more personal ones in a way, for wanting to promote and broadcast the works of Professor Shoplin. He was from the first a friend of the Danube Institute. He promoted us. He attended a great many of our conferences Sometimes at very short notice, he wrote for the two magazines with which we are associated, namely the Hungarian Review and the Hungarian Conservative, where he was chairman of the editorial board. I would say he gave us intellectual respectability by association. Once um, people uh, knew that George was a figure who liked to come to our events, uh, they were happier to do so as well. And I don't know any speaker, however eminent, who could match George's ability to respond to a complex and powerful argument so brilliantly without having previously seen it in advance. It was a real gift which we exploited mercilessly. He had a mind that was not only well-stocked, but also well-ordered, so that he could produce the apposite quote or the decisive refutation at the drop of a hat. But, ladies and gentlemen, I will not sing George's praises any further because we have an entire choir of public figures and personal friends who can do so more effectively. We have gathered here tonight a group of distinguished academics, politicians, and scholars who will address the mosaic that is Professor George Soflin. Their bios uh, are on the screen and in the program, and they will be shown as the uh, proceedings proceed. But let me give a brief introduction to each of them now. Zolt Nemeth, the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Hungarian Parliament, wrote the foreword and published the Hungarian version of his last book. Slovakian former Deputy Minister, Pal Chaki, served with George as a fellow MEP in the European Parliament. Professor Ferenc Mislovitz of the University of Pannonia worked alongside Professor Shoflin at the Graduate School. Political scientist Ferenc Horscher will look at the intersection of George's work as an academic and as a politician. And finally, my longtime colleague, Jula Cotolani, poet, academic, politician, and editor, will remark on his long friendship with George, who wrote regularly for the Hungarian Review. I want to welcome them all. Uh, they are already seated, so I will now ask, first of all, Pal Chaki to address us. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a privilege of mine to be here today. Thank you very much for the invitation, and especially thank you very much for the possibility to meet a short speech today. So, Schöpflin. When someone pronounces the name of Dury in front of me, the first thing I see is a kind, smiling face. This was George Schöpflin. He could even smile when he was angry, really. I also experienced <clears throat> a few situations with him, uh, when his completely logical proposal was not ac accepted by political partners from political reasons. His reaction was very well groomed. 
he smiled, looked at me and asked me, what is their common sense? It was the habitus of a scientist who knew they had intellectual superiority. Yuri himself was the personified smile and the personified correctness. For a Hungarian, he was very English, but as an Englishman, he also smuggled in some Hungarian openness. It's been maybe 20 years period since I first met him. It happened here in Budapest at an international conference. I was a member of the Slovak government at the time, facing the biggest challenge of my life. I was a responsible member of the government for preparing my country, Slovakia, for EU membership. And I was also responsible for organizing the related referendum. The jury felt, we felt uh, the importance of this, asked a lot of questions and gave a lot of advices. He was among the first to congratulate when the referendum was successful. I note that uh, in the short history of Slovakia, eight referendums have been held, but only this one was successful. Slovak law, a very strict 50% participation rate for success. It still fills me with joy when Slovak historians and political analysts write about the members of the Hungarian community living in Slovakia and about us, the politicians of this community, that we greatly contributed to the success of Slovakia between 1998 and 2006. It can be pro proven uh, that even in the case of the EU referendum, the participation rate uh, was higher in the southern part of Slovakia when we are living uh, than in our regions of uh, the country. However, not everyone likes that if we add to this that Slovakia is also indebted to the Hungarian community living there. This could be settled, for example, by adopting a law on cultural autonomy for our community and for all minority communities in the country. Slovakia is a most multi-ethnic society in the European Union, with at about 20% of uh, the population belonging to some minority community, minority um, national minority community in the country. As a convinced European, Judy was therefore concerned about whether we would be able to effectively unify Europe in 2004. He really supported us and was very happy that the move was, that the move was successful. And we are already at the second point related to Yuri. He was very interested in the situation of minorities too. It was a matter of principle for him. The sentence means that he was a not a typical politician. He viewed the events from a moral and principled point of view. And I'm able to say today here that we need many such people in the leadership of the EU now too. Favor officials and more committed politicians. I'm happy to say that we were also good friends in person. He presented several of my books in Hungary, in Slovakia, and also in Brussels. Imagine he was a politician who read a lot. I'm afraid it's almost a little bit unusual in today's world. With his departure, Europe lost a lot. He was a child of an age where there was more spirit and vision and less technocratic bureaucracy. That's why that era 
in the history of Europe could be successful. We have been colleagues really in the European Parliament since 2014. We become even closer. We talk a lot of all topics. We spend many hours together, the two of us. I remember him calling me often to say to see if I had time for a little chat. I became the vice chair of the EU uh, European Parliament uh, petition, Petitions Committee. He often gave, gave advice of specific European matter. It was very, very important for me because I'm afraid there is now also today, 20 years after the reunification of Europe, a small iron curtain in our minings. We from uh, eastern part of Europe, European Union, don't understand maybe very well the details of the problems of Western European society and this is vice versa. So they have also some problems to understand us. So I need, I, I think uh, we need more communication. That's the reason why I published when I was a member of the European Parliament, a book in uh, four languages, a voice from Central Europe. So try to, to initiate a, a new uh, wave of, of dialogue for us, because I think it's, it's, it's uh, extremely important. He, his insights were professional, not just a few narrows point of view. That is why he was loved, not only in the European People's Party group, but also respected in all political groups in the European Parliament. Because of this, he was the rapporteur of the most sensitive issues. Shefflin, was simply a concept. Perhaps the members of Fides will be not very angry if I tell you that he was mentally, he was mentally the youngest member of the Fides group. <laughs> if you look at the birth data, he was the oldest, of course, but if we look at the mental conditions, mental reactions, if we look uh, the freshness of uh, his thinking. He was really the youngest young Democrat in the Fidesz group. He always tried to objectively examine the issues in the Fidesz fraction too. So he was not a party soldier, but an intellectual who saw the truth. And sometimes, he suffered from speaking and reading several languages. He was able to compare the analysis uh, of the Hungarian language press with the international analysis. And he must have, have sometimes seen that uh, they, worry, uh, they are sometimes a little bit different from each other. He was not happy uh, about that nor that Fidesz left the European People's Party. He considered this as a mistake. So, Mr. George Chaplin, our dear jury, was a chevalier, a knight in an age that did not respect very well chevalry. He was an intellectual, he was a very colorful individual in a political milieu that preferred grayness. In that sense, he was not a child of his time. But how terrible era would, be, uh, would have been if there were no such shining personalities in it. So it was a honor for me to know him and to work with him. It's also an honor that he expressed important opinions about my work and my books. My dear jury, our dear jury, rest in peace. And thank you.
Thank you really for everything. Thank you very much. Now, may I ask the next uh, speaker, Ferenc Horsha, uh, to uh, go to the rostrum. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Piret, John, uh, dear friends, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, a difficult task. Uh, a pleasure because we are among friends and because we are uh, dealing with the most important things for our life, uh, our country and our culture. But it's difficult because uh, we are uh, in memory here for a friend who has just left us and who is uh, still uh, so important for us that we should discuss his ideas uh, in common. What I propose here is uh, the perspective of an academic. It's very nice that uh, we sit at the same table, politicians and academic, because uh, George was the exceptional case who was both an academic and a politician. And for both, he was good. And that's the real exception, because there are a lot of intellectuals who go for politics, and that's a disaster often. There is uh, the, the opposite of that, politicians who go for academy, and that's quite often a disaster. And uh, that was not the case with him. And that's why I think he is an exceptional character and someone who is worth reading. What I propose here is to talk not about uh, contested Europe, but about the contested identities of George. Uh, I talked about this distinction between the Vita Activa and the Vita Contemplativa in his life, but now I would like to talk about the three identities that he had, uh, which would be uh, easily uh, taken as uh, contested identities, but which he, in a, un for me, ununderstandable way, he uh, compromised or even better harmonized. He was a Hungarian, a Central European, and a European uh, person. Let me start with his being Hungarian, because that's uh, the core. That's uh, the first and basic uh, identity of his. He was born into a literary family, a family of literary merits, uh, his uh, grandfather, uh, Oladár Schöpflin, editor of uh, perhaps the most important uh, journal, literary and cultural journal of 20th century Hungary, Nyugat. Uh, the editor uh, who uh, was uh, perhaps uh, uh, one of the most influential to establish that organ. And uh, this is the, the, the identity that uh, I associate with his being Hungarian. He was a Hungarian who was uh, born into culture, into literature, into uh, the arts, uh, and politics was uh, downstream uh, from culture in his mind. His father was Jula Schöflin, once again uh, a literary uh, personality, once again uh, someone who uh, made his contributions to Hungarian literature as a translator, but uh, he became also a diplomat, and as such, uh, he tried to serve his country in the, the most uh, dangerous times uh, in the uh, early communist period when they had to leave the country. But uh, uh, George uh, preserved that identity, that core identity of being a Hungarian. Uh, he left the country very uh, young, and he uh, could uh, uh, preserve that uh, basic uh, identity, his Hungarian culture, which uh, uh, was uh, his heart, I would say. Then uh, let's talk about the second level of this identity, uh, Central Europe. Uh, in this uh, uh, volume, which is uh, uh, a real uh, 
treasure, uh, I would say, and which uh, we are all uh, uh, grateful to the publisher, Helena Press, uh, for uh, publishing it uh, after uh, what I thought was the last book of his, uh, European Police, which uh, uh, was uh, published uh, by our university and, uh, and uh, Jolt Nemeth's uh, uh, original organization. The European Police, that's the English title of the book. Uh, uh, and I thought that was the last one. And I was not aware that there is still something in, in his uh, mind, and that's uh, Contested Europe. And in that book, uh, there is a fine essay which I uh, would call attention to about Central Europe, about the, the, the fate of Central Europe based on uh, the ideas of uh, uh, Milan Kundera. And uh, the issue is uh, why Central Europe is lost in the 20th century, why it is uh, uh, under attack uh, from all sides, uh, uh, either in the totalitarian regimes or in, in democracy. And his uh, uh, theory uh, or the, the, the proposition in, of that essay is that what uh, uh, happens in Central Europe is a historical uh, line of events leading to a loss of uh, agency because of the external powers that uh, keep uh, pressurizing this uh, region. And as a result, uh, uh, Central Europe is in the hands of uh, external powers. Uh, and then uh, when the, the West tries to uh, save Central Europe, because the West always tries to save uh, uh, people, regions, uh, the world, uh, and that's very nice, uh, uh, sometimes uh, not really uh, wanted by the, 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 those who <laughs> will get saved, but anyway, uh, the fact is that uh, th that mission is never completed. Central Europe is not saved by Western Europe. It's uh, the, the project of saving Central Europe is incomplete. And in this incompleteness lies uh, the, the fate of this country because what they uh, uh, recognize is that, uh, and here he is talking about Central Europe. So uh, basically the V4 countries or Habsburg Europe uh, plus uh, the Polish, uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth, as my uh, learned young friend uh, uh, suggested uh, to me. That's how we could uh, identify Central Europe. In fact, uh, the case is that, uh, that Central Europe remains incomplete and, lima uh, and remains uh, lacking agency. And I think that leads us to the third dimension, to the European dimension of George, when the uh, professor, the academic uh, person who uh, actually uh, gave uh, his analysis of the fate of his country, tries to do something. And that's, you know, the limit which uh, an academic should never uh, step uh, over. And he did neither do that until uh, he uh, uh, retired. So uh, when he had the, the chance actually to do something uh, after thinking about uh, something. And that uh, action, the, the stage for that action was the European Parliament. And that was the, the, the real uh, possibility for him to test his theory and to see whether Central Europe can become uh, a region of agency. Uh, Central European countries, whether Central European countries can uh, regain their uh, potential for action. And, uh, well, we can be quite critical about this region, and uh, certainly there were serious mistakes uh, uh, committed uh, by these uh, uh, political elites uh, of this region uh, after the transition as well. But what we see at the moment, I would say, is that Central Europe is uh, awakening. Uh, it's not a walk, but awakening. And uh, what is uh, uh, happening is that uh, they regain uh, potential. Both Hungary and Poland is a country uh, which uh, proves uh, its ability to act. And I think George was part of that uh, elite which uh, led these countries to this uh, um, a phenomenon on a European level. And in this way, he tested his uh, 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 theory and he proved that it's not 
something determined. It's not a Marxistic deterministic world that we live in, that we can make difference if, if we do and uh, uh, do what uh, we need to do, and if we do it together with uh, our friends in Central Europe, preserving our national identity, uh, in George's ca case, his Hungarian identity, but uh, working on a European level together. So that's the, 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 the heritage that we, I think, need to uh, uh, study, and we need to preserve for our better life in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. I mean, it's a funny situation because, you know, whole afternoon I have been reflecting that I will be the last speaker, which means that every thought that I want to say here will be by then, I think, uh, exploited and consumed by my friends. And I was just sort of trying to find out what, what, what to say, uh, which is something new, perhaps. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. So, um, yes. That's the difference between an active politician and a retired, a re and a retired politician. Well, anyhow, <laughs> of what we have heard so far, first of all, I wanted to talk about the family, which Ferenc began to talk about the family. And, and there is a little more about the family to say, I think because uh, it's, it's a very eminent family that he comes from, uh, the, the Schoffrin family. And uh, through his grandfather and his father, he not only, you know, you, you can't say that he inherited rank or he inherited wealth. He inherited a tradition of excellence uh, a loyalty to Hungary and Hungarian culture, and he inherited uh, criterions, very high standards, criteria, sorry, very high standards. And I think, um, and let me be a little personal, it's not an easy thing, you know, I myself, I'm coming from a family with various eminent forebears, and, uh, you know, it's not easy to create your own personality. It takes some time. And uh, about the, uh, Ferenc said a few words about Aladar Schöpflin. I think he was the most judicious uh, critic and, his, and literary historian in the Nugat circle. And he always thought in terms of, of a whole Hungarian literature, which was very important. He, he resisted literary partisanship. He did a great deal in the early 20th century for the two emerging great writers, Imre Adi and Zygmunt Moritz. Uh, his father, Jula Schöflin, uh, as it was quite usual in the 30s for people coming from such a background or from an upper middle class family, was very much on the left. It's, uh, you know, today in Hungary, um, there is an intellectual fashion to say that, you know, the, the left, uh, you know, has always been a, a, in error. Uh, a, le a left is an aberration. But historically, this is, this is not true. Historically, we have to state every now and again that in the 1930s, when uh, we had emerging what I usually call the second Hungarian reform generation, I think that the uh, dominant, the dominant tenor of this generation was plebeian and, and leftist. On a big range, of course, from, the, from some communists to Christian socialists. Jura Schöpflin himself, the father, uh, also a writer, as Ferenc mentioned, in fact, uh, I think he may have been a clandestine member of the Communist Party. He was even <clears throat> imprisoned for a few months um, at one time, he belonged to the f circle of the famous uh, poet uh, Miklos Radnoti. <clears throat> uh, after 45, many people in this generation, 
uh, raised into very high positions in politics and public life. He became the, the cultural uh, director of the Hungarian radio. And uh, in 1950, he was, uh, he was um, nominated as ambassador of Hungary for the Scandinavian countries. So they moved in 1950 to Stockholm and actually he resigned in the same year. He will, at that time, he belonged to the Social Democrats, uh, Jula Schofrin, and I think he saw the writing on the wall. And probably at the time when he accepted the job here in Budapest, he was already planning, you know, to 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 leave, to leave, uh, to give up his Hungarian citizenship, and they emigrated to to Britain. I met. Uh, 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 George, uh, for the first time in in 1969 in London, uh, that uh, when he belonged to a very important intellectual and political circle of Hungarians in London, who were converging on one side <clears throat> on the Hungarian program of the BBC. Great uh, prominent writers and politicians uh, worked at that time for the Hungarian program of the BBC, and also uh, the School of Slavonic and in East European Studies at the university. He was very he was he was at that time he was he was a withdrawn person as I knew him. We didn't get intimate. We had very common friends, and I think he was looking. Uh, he was uh, ahead of him was a very. Uh, it was a modern academic career, and, and, and that's what happened. He taught at the London School of, London School of Economics. And uh, as he writes himself in the introduction to this book, he, was, he became early on a, a very uh, earnest, sincere supporter of integration into the European Union. By the way, talking about the, the, this book, I think someone already mentioned the introduction. I believe that the introduction to this book is really a short intellectual and political autobiography. And I think it's, it's, it's an incredibly interesting, intellectually very interesting and brave, courageous writing. I, 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 would, I will see that this is being published in Hungarian as soon as possible. Uh, and... Uh, Perhaps this, this is the point where we can uh, ret uh, return maybe the, to the main themes of, of this evening because most of us here have been in contact with, 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 with George as, as a uh, representative of the European Parliament on behalf of Fidesz. Uh, we didn't talk very much. Uh, he began, uh, I became editor-in-chief of uh, G uh, editor -in -chief of Hungarian Review in which, uh, the, the review which we founded on, in, 20, uh, in 2010, but soon enough he began, he began to be a, a regular contributor. We didn't talk much, but I was sensing that, that becoming a member of the Europe, European Parliament must have been a, a very, very tough thing for George, because you have here a European a uh, social scientist and political scientist with the best possible, I would say, Anglo-Saxon credentials. Really, I think if you read this introduction or any of the essays, you can see uh, that he has a thorough knowledge of that, that whole tradition. And, uh, and, and he, I, th I'm, 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 I think I, I'm not wrong when I call him a a, a genuine liberal, if, if I think, I'm looking at his wife, if he agrees with that description. And then, then at the European Parliament, he has, um, uh, you know, uh, our friend Chucky said that he was the youngest in, in the Fidesz group. He really had to be very young, very flexible, I think, uh, to, to to adapt himself to that situation where his own time-honored classical liberalism was, I think, really put to the test exactly because I think of 
of the liberal leadership of the uh, of the European Union, and, and uh, I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to uh, uh, to dwell too much on this on this piece, but there are great insights. There are great insights. For instance, he he writes a few paragraphs about power. Something is very interesting that people in politics and political scientists, some of them are, 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 are many of them are very ashamed of to speak of power, which they are practicing all the time. <laughs> and Dury is not, he's not shy. He, yes, he said, yes, yes, we are talking about power, but yes, we are talking about power in every, actually every human relationship, every human community, every human transaction. Uh, I, I don't want to dwell only one point in this introduction uh, uh, to show the uh, uh, the very very wide grasp that he had. He says the following in a paragraph. He's talking about asymmetries in uh, the European Union uh, uh, polis, as he says, culture. The other area of asymmetry is the one that can be identified through complexity theory. Complexity is driven by globalization, and the EU problem is that in many ways it remains a pre-globalization -global institution. It continues to work on the assumption that emergent properties play no role, that accumulation of power in Brussels has only those consequences that are clear and visible. Then a second flawed assumption is that the relationship between cause and effect is proportional. This is true of some situations, but all too often the butterfly effect creates havoc via unintended consequences, ones ignored by the actors of the police. I, I think this is an outstanding paragraph because you won't hear many politicians and many political and social scientists talking about complexity and talking about the butterfly effect. So I think it's, it's a intellectually and politically a superb uh, work uh, and uh, the continuation of the, of, of the paragraph is the dream of Monet, of the Monet method of integration, that each and every integrative step is uniformly implemented throughout the polis is just that, a, a dream. It is unsustainable because some processes are irreversible and move toward chaos. Well, I think I'm, I have I've consumed a lot of time and uh, perhaps uh, a, little, a little further and perhaps we'll quote one more thing and, and, and I feel that my function here will be uh, fulfilled. Uh, it's it's, it's the, the question of being Central European, which he, he, he writes a lot about, he thinks a lot about, beginning with uh, Milan Kundera, whom you also mentioned, I think, already. Um, maybe Ferenc, and um, and he 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 notes the thing that that Ferenc talked about that the ideal of completeness is measured against what Central Europeans believe to be the completeness of the West, and he says that uh, Central Europe uh, and uh, this is Kundera's idea. Central Europe functions as Europe's early warning system. Systems are set up for, and, and for various reasons they don't work well. Hence the shortcomings of the system, as such they are exposed. This is what Central Europe has shown repeatedly and has thereby earned the eternal disdain of happier countries to the West. I think this is, is, this is a, a target of many of our debates today about European Union and Hungary. Finally, uh, one more quotation. He talks about Czeslav Milos, uh, the great European uh, writer and, and, and poet who was also an emigre like himself. And he, he mentions this example. 
that Milos uh, believed that Central Europe, the whole of Central Europe, are better placed to see Europe in the round than those who are in, at the center. He says Milos was not in any sense relying on center-periphery theory, and he explicitly denies that the world has a center. But for many in Western Europe, theirs remains the only true authentic possible way of thinking and acting. Hence, they have extreme difficulty in accepting that the central European difference is not something malevolent or just contrarian, but is the outcome of long durée historical processes to which they and their forebears contributed in no mean quantity. Well, uh, later on, I may say thanks if there are questions. But thank you very much for your patience. Jula, thank you very much indeed. May I now invite Professor Ferenc Bislovic. So, um, thank you for inviting me, Catherine, and um, I'm, I'm glad that this, this, this gathering is happening, I, I had the feeling that um, something was missing after Yuri left us. Um, there was a reburial in, in Budapest um, uh, um, in March, and um, unfortunately very, um, very few people showed up. Um, we had a long conversation after that with Pirat that we should, um, how to say it, um, put together something which is not just um, uh, is a memorial place for, for George Schöpflin, but to, um, to try to keep the discourse, um, the, the different kinds of narratives Yuri was so good at um, alive. And um, but I suggested to do it in a tiny little city, um, uh, which is, I think, hope intellectually getting more significant. Um, it's called Kuseg, Guns of Deutsch, at the Austrian Hungarian border. It's just a little correction that John should not know that that I yes I'm professor of um, University of Pannonia, but it's a side job. The University of Pannonia's campus is in small cities around Pannonia and Kuseg is the smallest where we teach um, several of us who are here, but we established an institute, a unique one, and not, um, it's not very well known one, but um, somehow which is floating in, 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 uh, in the Hungarian um, I don't know, orbit, uh, called the Institute of Advanced Studies, Kürsseg. And George was, until his, um, uh, his, his test, he was the president of the advisory board. So as, as a matter of fact, this is why I'm just, sorry, just take it. I, I knew he was, he was, uh, he was sick. Um, he never talked about it, but in the last minute. Um, but we knew that it is important to, to put together something for his 80th birthday, and they did not want to come out, so I'm curious. So, so it was, it, he was already 81 when this book was was actually published, which, um, which is full of essays of people who are sitting here. Um, Jody Jensen actually be co-edited with um, Attila Polk, an so old friend of colleague, and they all belong to the Institute. And Ferenc Hörscher is also a, a, a frequent visitor. So I just um, want to tell you that um, George was able to participate in the book launch online, and it was one of the the best discussions we had with many participants online and, and sitting there. And this is what I, I, um, I would like to suggest here, a little bit of a reframing of, of uh, Joe Shefflin's um, picture. Um, I, 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 in a friendly way challenge, but, but Ferenc, my, my friend, said, I don't think Shefflin was a politician. Yes, he served a uh, cause. He was sitting for 50 years in the European Parliament 
and we, 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 we knew each other. We, we met first accidentally on the streets of London when I was there <laughs> in 81 as a student. And I remember this very well. I didn't have a penny in my pocket and my friend was, was walking with me and then they came with Sarkozy Zimoti and they, they, so they knew each other. So we had a, our first conversation, which was like, like always. He started, he asked me, what are you doing? What are you translating? Emmanuel Wallerstein, Modern Verse. Oh, there are people in Budapest who know who is Emmanuel Wallerstein. And so, and this, this was the kind of conversation we always had. So whenever, wherever we met, we just continued. So that was his incredible capability, this fluidity, this flow of ideas. There was an archetype um, Central European intellectual who at a certain point um, decided to, to serve a cause and also, yeah, it's a political decision and it was, um, yes, in the parliamentary faction of Fidesz, the European Parliament, which I did not understand. So when we met, we were teaching together in University of Bologna um, so teaching different courses that we had a chance to talk. Um, I, I asked the jury, what are you doing? What is this? And he said, you know, Ferry, um, I think it was high time to do something different. I think I was, I'm, I'm writing too much. And it's getting more and more complicated. I myself sometimes don't understand what I want to say. So there is some, it's, it's high time to do something different. And that kind of sense of humor. This irony. And do you, can you give me a, a, a name of a politician with this kind of capability? Maybe Jolt. Uh, this uh, hidden capability should, should show us more often. There is no humor in politics. No irony and certainly no self-irony. And Schöpflin was very famous of this capability. Yeah. He, he did not like to, to, to sit people together who agreed with him all the time. He loved to be challenged. He enjoyed, enjoyed debates and discussions. And this is one of the reasons why I felt he was so close to me, but very, very different, coming from very different backgrounds, etc. But that's the joy of discussion and, and discovering new ideas coming from other people. That moved him all around in Central Europe, and from even to, to, to the West, it was after Budapest, Stockholm, and, and London and Scotland and a little bit Bruges, but then he moved back in search of Central Europe. That was one of his first um, edited volume, published, I don't know, when, in the early 90s probably. Um, yes, and, and he could not find certain, we can, could not find certain uh, Central Europe. And, and then one of his best essays, uh, maybe the best one in this um, in the volume that he published, here in English, Contested Europe, was published by us. Um, Jody and, and myself co-edited it, and it published by Routledge in 2015, um, he, where his essay's title is The Epistemological Crisis of Europe. And that is completely true. He, as, as actually myself, were true believers of European integration, in European integration, of European integration. Um, until 2004, the double no. There was a democratic vote, but on the nation state level, about the future of the European integration. Then 2005 and all these frustrations we, we all know. Um, and he calls himself in the, in the foreword, in the preface of the, the this volume, a, a Euro critical person. He was never Eurosceptic. I don't even think, I'm sorry if, if, if I hurt your, your feelings, I don't, it's not my purpose. I don't even think he was conservative. It was a kind of, yes, he's speech-wise. It was certainly um, the, the, the more British English than anyone in, in Britain, probably. Um, yes, that sounded very um, conservative. His sense of humor and questioning himself, because I don't know too many people um, in this conservative circle. Maybe there are, maybe there are. But it's also liberal. It's also a little socialist, social democratic. And, um, and again, as I'm saying, he was a great East, Central European intellectual who was looking for his own identity, 
and he found it partly in, in Tallinn, partly in Budapest, I think a little bit also in Kyrsek, where he was always present for, for, for 25, I don't know how many, how many universities he was there um, at the beginning also with, with Piret. Um, and he organized the conferences with the British Council about the future of, of um, East, Eastern enlargement everywhere in Prague and Budapest and everywhere. So he believed, as, as many of us, that this is the best way yeah, to move, to find a, a new space for small countries like Hungary or Estonia. Um, but of course, um, it needless to say, for the time being, we feel we failed or it did not happen. The success has not yet come. Um, but I'm sorry, it's not just Western Europe. It's not the Western part of Europe with this permanent Hungary bashing and or Orban bashing. It's, the, it's us, too. We are also in an epistemological crisis. We don't know exactly what we are doing. And what is missing, exactly the attitude of, of Schöpflin George, to, to, capable, to be capable to challenge each other, to dialogue, and to, to question things. This is completely missing in politics. It's, yeah? There are monologues and, and hate speeches and then, and, 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 and it was not like that in, in the 80s. So we were, many of us were part of, uh, of the European East-West dialogue and European movements and we had, and now, so we should think about it. So I think this should be really emphasized when talking about Schöpflin and his heritage, that he was a person who was ready ready for any kind of debate, any kind of challenges. I, I just tell you one and then I finish. One story, um, when I was, um, thanks to Attila Polk, invited to teach uh, a couple, uh, two courses at Columbia University in New York and our mentor Attila's great fan, Istvan Deak, um, you know, just generously invited me and, and we had a lot of discussions and once, um, of course, about the present political situation and the new government and and once he told me there was another guy whose name is probably also known, Charles Gatti. Charles Gatti, he is a 56er and was a, 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 one of the, 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 the prominent Hungary bashing person. And um, he was asked to debate democracy and the future of Europe with, with George. There was a podcast. But I think the Institute for the Wissenschaft and for Menschen was very, very much interested, so I was listening very carefully. And then I talked to Istvan I said, well, Charles, Charles Gatti came here and said, never again. I will never again um, talk to or this debate in the public with George Schiffer is so much more knowledgeable. Yeah, so he, they could not, nobody could really um, intellectually, no, what was it? It's not just politics, it was literature, it was history, it was social theory, it was gastronomy, it was languages. So when he was already really sick, we talked every week, as much as I could, I called him, and he, he always told me that, that I'm going to get better, I'm, going, I'm, I'm coming to Kyrgyzeg, and we should, very, very, we should really think about inviting writers, poets from Croatia, from Slovenia, from Estonia. And he gave me names. I said, do you know any Croatian poet? Why don't we take care of Romanian literature? And so he had this fantastic plans in search of Central Europe, which is our job. So we should, I think, find ourselves, East and Central Europeans, in this huge mess. Yeah, in this, this big interregnum that uh, Sigmund Bauman uh, called this time, or the, 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 the age of, new age of uncertainty, like Elamir Honkish said, that we should find more, um, how to say it, elegantly and clearly our jobs, our tasks ahead to redefine what we are. And what is our purpose? Why are we members of the European Union? Are we just uh, endlessly bashing Western Europe and the Western liberals? And that's the end game? Or do we have something to offer? And this is what Schöpfling could have done. And the people who are in his footsteps were able to, it's not, there's no need for it in, in today's political world. But I think we should 
put, on, put up our hands. That here, hi guys, here we are, he's shuffling. So, <coughs> so um, heritage, so um, Pirat is, is very welcome. She's coming to Kösseg, and uh, we, we start to put together not only a shuffling archive, but, um, but more, more than this, and continue these discussions. And I have the privilege and the pleasure to invite you to participate in this um, online or offline in a, in a hybrid way, we need to continue the dialogue about ourselves and question ourselves, not just our imagined or real adversaries. So thank you for listening to me. And now, fi finally, may I now ask Dr. Nemeth to, to, to sum up. Thank you, John. And uh, John asked me to uh, welcome uh, the South Korean and the Malaysian ambassador among us. And I would also like to welcome two uh, ladies who have been very close also uh, to George. Church uh, Emesha. Emesha has been the private secretary of uh, George and uh, Nadia Gertrude, who may not be with us, uh, but who has been uh, the other very close uh, friend and uh, colleague of George uh, through 15 years in the European Parliament, and who has been, who has, and both of them have been instrumental in the successful work of George. Uh, so many have been said, I would like to, uh, add to this that George had a big heart. Uh, that is uh, a heart which was able to uh, <clears throat> integrate uh, many things. We got to know each other in 1988 uh, when uh, we had a, a George Soros scholarship in Oxford uh, and uh, Right after me, it was Viktor Orban uh, who had this uh, scholarship. So the two of us, we got to know George in those uh, years, uh, 88, 89. And uh, I have to tell you that from the very, very first moment, uh, Schöflin uh, Yuri became uh, a very central and close member of our political family. Uh, it was also helpful to us uh, to go to the BBC, which was uh, quoted by uh, Gyula Kodolányi, uh, not only the late 60s, but the late 80s, uh, we could exploit uh, the BBC Hung the Hungarian broadcast uh, for our aims. Uh, Herr Ferenc also uh, was before us uh, at, this, at this scholarship. Uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, we have been able to get 20 pounds for each interview. So uh, every month uh, we gave an interview. Uh, uh, and under advice of George, this was very welcome uh, to our, and the lunch uh, to our uh, student budget. Uh, but uh, truly what I would like to uh, underline that uh, there has not been uh, such a, a high prestigious intellect uh, joining our political family right away from the very first moment like George. Uh, in 1990, when we have organized our first summer uh, university, uh, in Balvanos, in Transylvania. Uh, Yuri was our guest, and since then, there was not many. He wouldn't have uh, participated. And uh, he lent to Fides a very high prestige. Uh, we were under 35, as you all remember. We had the age limit, uh, which we have removed only in 1993, when we realized that we may reach it. Uh, but uh, uh, Fidesz in those years was void of uh, a very uh, strong uh, intellectual background. 
but uh, Schoeffling Dirge was probably uh, a very unique exception in this regard. So he had a big heart uh, and a very deep loyalty uh, to our political family. I can see that because Fidesz went through uh, a lot of uh, changes in the last uh, 34 years. But uh, one thing was sure, that uh, Schoeffling Yuri was with us from the very first, first moment. Uh, we may debate what he was uh, 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 politically and so on, and we may debate who, what was Fidesz uh, in 1988 and what is uh, Fidesz today, but uh, we were what Schoeffling was and Schoeffling was what we were. Uh, there was not a deeper and a stronger link uh, between the elite of uh, Fidesz than he himself. So for that very reason, uh, that kind of commitment, what he has testified, uh, throughout the 15 years he was our member of the European Parliament, was not just uh, happening uh, in uh, uh, 2005 until 2019, but it started uh, in uh, 1988, and it lasted uh, throughout the whole of his life. He had a, a other important uh, segment in his heart, and that was the uh, Hungarian national minorities. Uh, let us uh, uh, recognize that, yes, he was a very uh, committed Hungarian, uh, as uh, Ferenc said, but, uh, and both Ferenc's, uh, but uh, uh, the commitment towards the Hungarian national minorities from, from the very first moment was a clear commitment. The first uh, book from uh, Dirk, Dury, was uh, his publication, uh, probably by the minority rights group, Hungarians in Romania. Uh, and I, I suggest you reading that because that was unveiling the situation of the Hungarians in Romania. And at this point, I would like to recognize Shogor Chaba, uh, uh, also a colleague of Yuri, uh, member of the European Parliament from Transylvania uh, for long years uh, with us. Uh, and uh, then on awards. But this was not just a commitment uh, to a... a part of the Hungarian nation, uh, which has lived through uh, very difficult decades, but he was intellectually motivated also uh, to try to find uh, answers to the minority existence. And uh, if I may uh, draw an attention to another book, Uh, uh, published by the Prominoritate Foundation and the English version was published by the Public uh, Service University by Jorge Herher Ferenc's uh, uh, university. And uh, uh, yes, I thought that this is the last book, but not this is the last book, but now uh, we are introducing. And this book is dedicated uh, to uh, Ernest Gellner and uh, Anthony Smith, the two most uh, prominent uh, uh, 20th century researchers of uh, the minority uh, rights protection, uh, who were friends uh, with George and who have exchanged ideas and who were crucial in the development of the uh, international minority protection legal system. Uh, especially developing uh, after the transition after 1990, uh, the Framework Convention, the Language Charter, and all the other international uh, documents uh, which have developed into uh, this direction. And he has never given up on this commitment. Uh, the uh, deep uh, understanding of the uh, minority situation and uh, their uh, uh, support in uh, multiple fora, especially in the European Parliament later on. The third uh, uh, <clears throat> compartment in this heart uh, 
uh, was uh, to Europe, yes. He was a true European, and uh, in this book, I think he has written his testimony. And for uh, this reason, I would like to suggest you uh, to get this book, uh, published by the uh, Mary Ratio Foundation, uh, and uh, you can reach that at uh, Mary Ratio website. Uh, 15 years experience about uh, the European police. It has two parts. Uh, one is about Europe and the other is about our, us, uh, Hungarians, us Central Europeans. And uh, the criticism uh, on uh, uh, Europe is uh, very sharp, like it is very sharp in that uh, uh, preface. Uh, which uh, opens this uh, new book. Uh, probably uh, the strongest exp uh, expression is that from a voluntary European Union, we have turned into a punishing European Union. And uh, a punishing European Union uh, is definitely a dead end street, as uh, uh, George uh, puts it. Uh, but I think it is also important that he reflects upon us, uh, upon uh, ourselves, uh, who are relating uh, to Central Europe, to, to Europe, the European Union. And he has uh, a very uh, sad analysis that there is now an EU 14, uh, the old ones, and there is an EU uh, 11, 12, as you like it. And uh, uh, he is very sad that the communication has totally broken down between the eastern and western part of Europe. And I think that is uh, the, the essence of his uh, analysis. And we are in, in the midst of this paralyzed communication between the west and uh, central Europe. Uh, in the last 30 years, we have not been able to be regarded uh, democracies. That is the fundamental challenge that Central European countries have to confront constantly, that we are not recognized as democracies. And also, uh, he uh, writes about how uh, we relate to the West uh, in many uh, occasions and instances in a prejudiced way. The, the West, uh, which has uh, uh, lost its uh, character, which is not able to renew itself, which is not able to uh, thrive, and who has, which has not a uh, future. But what is the most important uh, in this book, uh, that probably with the language, with the style, and with the abstraction, uh, as uh, George writes about it, he's, he builds bridge between the western part and the central part of Europe. And uh, this is the fourth compartment in his heart, Central Europe. Central Europe, as uh, uh, many uh, uh, before me have uh, quoted him and uh, referred to him, because Central Europe is uh, uh, part of the solution for us Hungarians, uh, for the minorities of us, and for the dialogue uh, with Europe. Uh, and uh, that's why we uh, must not let down uh, the Central European idea, because uh, if we lose that one, and now I would like to refer to the importance of the Polish-Hungarian uh, cooperation, uh, maybe uh, the final momentum when we lose the possibility and the perspective of mutual understanding between the Western and the Central or Eastern, as you like, uh, part of Europe. And obviously this heart is really big. Uh, it had its part for uh, gastronomy. Uh, Piret must... Uh, 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 nod to me on that, uh, that the gastronomy was really the central part. Whenever we met in any corner, corner of Europe, 
he had a good restaurant where there was a good food and there were, and where there was, where was a good wine. And he knew best restaurants in Budapest and in Brussels, uh, uh, where we had uh, plenty of occasions uh, to visit. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to express my uh, gratitude uh, to uh, Helena Press, uh, because Helena Press realized that uh, for us Hungarians, it is vitally important to communicate in English. And Helena Press is doing it, not just talking about it, uh, but Helena Press in the past uh, years has embarked upon an enterprise that uh, let us make a professional uh, Hungarian language uh, publication uh, in the world. And until now, she is the most successful in this field. And that's why I would like to congratulate Katalin uh, for the publication of this book. Uh, and I hope uh, that many will follow because I know how many ideas you have in the uh, back of your mind. Now, I would like to congratulate uh, to Danube uh, Institute because Danube Institute is, is exactly doing the same uh, what uh, Kadal and Katalin is doing uh, in the US. Uh, the uh, Danube Institute is doing it in Budapest and we are extremely grateful to you, John. Uh, for your uh, commitment and your uh, work, and I hope that you will be able to continue this very unique mission uh, in the coming uh, years. Uh, and uh, I don't think there is a better focus for your activity, both of you, than uh, uh, George Shefflin, who himself is uh, a great interpreter between us Hungarians and the world and the West in general. So dear friends, whoever would like to uh, settle bills with the uh, neighbors uh, uh, in Europe or even further away, we must get to know uh, George uh, Shefflin, uh, learn from him and use his uh, tools and experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, th thank you, and uh, I sort of agree with your, uh, what you just said, too. Um, now, before I close, uh, let me just say, is there, since there are other friends uh, of George here in the audience, would anyone else like to add to what has been said? In briefly. And finally, <laughs> this is not the last finally, probably, but uh, is there anyone on the platform who would like to um, remain seated, probably, but just respond to what their colleagues have said? In that case, let me say, this has been an occasion with, I think, a very unique atmosphere because it's blended on the, it's blended two things. One is it's blended an appreciation of the work of a scholar who continued developing his ideas and criticisms fruitfully and influentially throughout his life and right to the moment in which he died. These books, after all we're discussing, were completed within a very short period before he died. Secondly, uh, the questions he raises in those books, particularly the, the questions he raises in the introduction, which several of the panelists have talked about, are really the questions that we all have to ask about the development uh, of European politics and uh, if Europe is to continue to be um, a major or continue to become a major force for democracy and progress in the world. Uh, I think several speakers, no, I think it was uh, Professor Mislovich pointed to George's position as um, a Eurocritical writer rather than a Eurosceptical writer. Uh, and I think he felt, he says somewhere, that in a way a Eurocritical writer is a bigger danger to the Brussels bureaucracy and its dominance 
than a Euroskeptical writer, because a Euroskeptical writer, I'm one, by the way, um, uh, he simply leaves the field and says, I'm going to join another game. A Eurocritical writer stays on the field and makes criticism and arguments in order to transform Europe. And that's, of course, what George did. I think it's a, obviously the death of a mind like his is a tragedy. I think it's not only a tragedy for Europe, but he'd only begun really the problem of the woke revolution in the West really only begun um, in recent times. And he hasn't had, he didn't have rather, the opportunity to subject it to his critical mind, which was not just Eurocritical, but I would say it was ideology critical. Um, the second thing I would say is that, as all of the comments have shown, George was a remarkable person and a, a great friend. He had all kinds of interesting qualities. He was, of course, a, a, a gourmet, uh, and he was a wit. Uh, and I remember on one occasion, having dinner with him, we took George to a restaurant, and I said to him, well, what did you think? I, we thought the food was rather good. He said, the food was excellent, he said. But eating it in an atmosphere that reminded me of being in a prison or a Bertolt Breck play uh, prevented my really enjoying it. So we didn't go there again. Uh, I think he... What can one say except that, do any of you remember, probably not, but there was in England in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, an advertisement for the uh, German sect, um, Henkel Trocken. And the advertisement was always the same essential idea. It showed a, a Victorian painting of a very grand occasion. Uh, one of them was, for example, Lord Salisbury proposes a toast to Benjamin Disraeli following his triumphant return from the Congress of Berlin. Another said, another was of uh, the wedding of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert and a, a celebratory uh, ball afterwards. And then underneath this grand painting, uh, it would say, Henkel Trocken adds distinction to the humblest occasion. And in a way, George added distinction to the humblest occasion, even when the occasion wasn't at all humble. And he did so by his wit and subversive Socratic questioning of the um, ideas and values of many people there who were discovering for the first time what it was to be gently destroyed by a master at the game. So I would like, uh, on behalf of everybody here, to thank uh, 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 Helena History Press and to finally say thank you very much for coming. Uh, I hope that you will all buy the book, uh, and I hope even more that you will read it, even if you have to borrow it from a library. So thank you very much indeed.